Welcome into the KSO Sunday show on a Monday. So this is like a Sunday show and a half. Uh, back to a little back delay. To back weeks. Yeah, yeah. Well, and this week, uh, look, a lot of circumstances playing into it. <laughs> yes, fan is still sick, but like I said on Sun uh, Saturday night, Sunday morning, he's not going to die. He'll be fine. He'll make it through <laughs> to the other side. But uh, he's he's not here. I still sound like I'm dying, but I'm not. I think I'm getting better. And Drew is back from Morgantown alive. So uh, let's start this this puppy off by asking you what you thought of Morgantown, West Virginia, for, for the first time. Yeah, Morgantown was was pretty cool. It was it was a weird atmosphere because it was really loud to start the game. And, and I mean, Chris Kleiman even talked about that today during his press conference. That at, at the beginning, it, it was loud. Uh, but a weird atmosphere in the sense that you can really tell, and, and especially if you watch uh, the highlight video that I did, uh, I'm also playing hurt, not sick, but I have probably like a softball sized bruise on my knee that I have no idea what it's from, uh, like on the side and back of my knee. No idea what that's from, but that was before even Saturday. So we're all kind of playing hurt here, uh, but you kind of got to see on the highlight video and hear a little bit just kind of the, the weird vibes in Morgantown of it seems like they're ready for Neil Brown to move on in one way or the other. And, and you could really hear it after the pick six that Garrett Green threw that, that the boos were definitely out and alive. And, and I cut off uh, after the fourth down play uh, that Avery escaped the sack, then found Ty Bowman. But you could hear uh, one of the West Virginia guys that was by me say, oh, that's the most Neil Brown play I've ever seen at West Virginia, <laughs> that that they had a free rusher come and miss the sack, and then it, it ends up being a first down. So it was interesting. Drive Having to go into Pittsburgh and drive in is a very odd thing. And then I told you guys this on Saturday night that I thought I was going to blow an eardrum in the first quarter because the Mountaineer kept finding, yeah. kept finding right where I was and blowing the musket. And I, I knew about the musket, but it still scared the absolute crap out of me the first time that it happened. Well, and I should have saved that video because that video, you could really tell that I got scared. We, uh, we really should limit, look, I, I don't want to dive into gun control in America <laughs> for the common man, but for mascots, I am all for uh, taking away their second amendment, right? Because those things are very loud on the field yeah. and like you're focused on so many other things. You don't know when they're about to go off. So if pistol Pete or Raider red is about to pop off some shots, a little desk pop other guy style it takes you by surprise you're like what the heck uh and yes so i totally understand where that comes from i my thing with my one trip to morgantown in 2022 it's interesting to hear you talk about the crowd because when i was there like i think that west virginia team went five and seven it was late in the season i mean that was the week after the baylor games so k-state only had one game left after that against ku and so the crowd was pretty non-existent. It really didn't feel or seem like anything all that different to me. Um, and it the only thing I remember is like when I first left the airport and driving around Pittsburgh and getting to where I stayed, it was like everywhere else I've traveled in the in the U.S., it's felt like, you know, uh, it's, you know, some of the terrain's different, but it still feels like whatever it just felt like i was in a totally different place like the terrain of the area and the way some of it laid out i, th I mean i thought it was cool uh but it was a little bit of a, a different experience so i did i did enjoy that aspect of it and everything but it's a fascinating place uh and it's nice that k-state's been able to get this winning streak going against west virginia after they kind of had a lull there where the mountaineers were, were causing problems for them so we'll talk a lot about k-state west virginia today get ready to start the week of the Sunflower Showdown between K-State and KU, which will be coming up and uh, look around the rest of the Big 12. But before we do that, good reminder for everybody that Farmageddon is coming this year. 
And you might be thinking, oh, I, I hope K-State doesn't have to play Iowa State three times in six months. Well, they might. And the third one could very well be taking place in Dublin, Ireland. That one is a fact. That one will be played. If you want to be there, you can join your Wildcats in Ireland as they kick off the 2025 football season against Iowa State in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Game tickets can be secured now through a travel or hospitality package. All inclusive travel packages include premium game tickets, luxury hotel accommodations, and exclusive K-State welcome experience and more. Game day hospitality packages include premium in-stadium hospitality with food and drinks and premium game tickets. Don't miss out on the trip of a lifetime. Book your package now at cats2ireland.com. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. All right. We got that taken care of. Time to talk Cats and Mountaineers. K-State now 6-1, and 3-1 and one in the Big 12. Best start through seven games in the Chris Kleiman tenure at K-State at 6-1. and one. Uh, What are your big takeaways from how K-State was able to get the job done in Morgantown and you know, play it, play another carefree game, which those are always kind of nice. And you think about, yeah, there was stress or frustra- frustration with BYU and Colorado and Big 12 play. But since the string of playing Big 12 teams, they've put away Arizona, Oklahoma State and West Virginia, which you would classify as not good teams in the Big 12 right now. So uh, what were some of your main takeaways from how the Cats played over the weekend? Yeah, I believe it was Tyler Dryling that posted it. Uh, on Saturday after the game that in the 25 games that K-State has played since the start of the 2023 season, K-State has won by 17 or more in 13 of them. So K-State is beating the crap out of some good and not so good teams, uh, which is always kind of fun to see that when they are winning, they're typically winning big. Uh, But the the biggest takeaway I think that I have from this West Virginia game is you're seeing K-State is able to win in multiple ways now. Uh, It's not just being able to run the football and just running the crap out of it and kind of taking the air out of the ball and winning in a way like that. The West Virginia game, K-State really struggled to run the ball until I would say about the time that West Virginia quit. When West Virginia was really into the game and really up for it and playing, they were stuffing DJ Giddens pretty well. Avery Johnson didn't run the ball at all. And Dylan Edwards was stuffed for more or less until, again, West Virginia quit as well. So being able to throw the ball to win is always a good sign. And to throw it so efficiently, I mean, Avery rarely put the ball into a tight situation, except for, I believe it was the Garrett Oakley touchdown, which was a great play by Oakley. Uh, but Casey kind of got whatever they wanted when they were throwing the ball yeah, to a point where I think that this could have been an even bigger day for Avery. If you take away uh, one drop to Jace Brown on a deep ball, and then Jace dropped another one in the fourth quarter. And then if Avery would have hit Will Swanson on a pass, he would have had four touchdowns through the air. So you got to look at it, and K-State still kind of left some meat on the bone passing-wise and still threw for 298 and completed 66% of their passes and keep hitting on big plays, which K-State was, I believe, uh, going into this last stretch of three games against Oklahoma State, Colorado, and West Virginia. They were near the bottom in the country in pass explosiveness. Uh, and uh, shout-out to Fan, even though he's sick, still posting the stats. Yeah. Uh, K-State is now uh, 41st in the country in pass explosiveness. So just a huge change in how uh, the offense has looked. And and I think that makes K-State even scarier because I still don't think that they've hit their max and their peak ceiling. And K-State's still 20th in points per drive, finding explosiveness in the run and pass game. And the success rate of both the run and pass game have just steadily increased as the season has gone on as well. Yeah, you know, and you talk about Avery left maybe another touchdown pass out there. He hits any of those. He also ends up with 300 yards passing. He came up just shy of it with 298. Uh, So he had a good day there. This was going to be tough because West Virginia, they have a decent run defense. You also kind of have to if your pass defense is going to be as bad as it is. And then you think about it, okay, what what does K-State do the best? They run the ball better than almost anybody in the Big 12. So let's just 
put all of our eggs in that basket, try to stop it. And if they beat us through the air, then they're going to beat us through the air because we don't have anything that can, can stop it. And what K-State did, like, I, I kind of put it into the context of, like, on Saturday night, you know, you, you go out there and you, you're going to play from the yellow tees instead of the blue tees on the golf course. Like, you're going to put yourself in some different situations than what you're accustomed to. But in theory, you should score better playing from a shorter yardage. Um, but it, it's going to challenge your game in some different ways. You're going to have to be better around the green because you're going to have shorter yardages in, all this other stuff. And K-State basically went out there and said, okay, you know, we, in some games, like we're playing from the blue tees, we, our normal game, whatever. In this one, we had a different kind of challenge. It was supposed to be easier. We made it easier for ourselves uh, because throwing the football when it's easy is easier than running the football. Um, like, I, I'm sure DJ Giddens would agree with that with as many times as he gets it and everything. But um, so that was that was big for K-State to prove that they could come through and make this happen and do that. Um uh, it's a good step in the right direction for him. And I think, you know, the receivers, the way that they made the plays is encouraging too. Jaden Jackson obviously had some big ones. And then you look around Keegan Johnson, I think he's just been really steady this year. Um, I don't know that even when there was all the, the hype in the off season, I think some people confuse that for like, Oh, he's going to go out there and just have hundred yard receiving games left and right. I, I think you're getting the right version of Keaton Johnson right now, where he's consistent every game. When you need him to step up, he's going to make some critical catches, make some nice plays, and he can rely on him right now. And and you can. And he's a rest perimeter blocker too. That that yeah. that that plays into a big a big factor in the run game. Yeah. So you had that. Jace Brown, there were the drops, but uh, I don't think we're worried about Jace Brown. Ty Bowman has become a legit reliable and usable player uh, in, in the receiving game since the Oklahoma state game when they trotted him out there. And, and then, you know, Dante Cephas has picked up uh, when he's had the opportunities recently. And then you look at the tight ends. It doesn't matter who it is. Uh, they continue to produce the tight ends got seven targets on Saturday. They caught all seven of them. Will Ancio and Garrett Oakley both came away with touchdowns. Uh, and you talk about blocking for guys that can catch the ball. Will Ancio is probably performed as the best blocking tight end for K-State this year. And if he can continue to do what he does, his usage will continue to go up like he's already seen it happen recently. So uh, I, I think all around the K-State offense, even though they weren't able to run the ball, and you would have probably liked to have been able to go into that game and impose your will a little bit more and kind of dictate the pace of it. Um, but at some point, and maybe they could have if they kept at it, but it also just became a lot easier for them to say, you know what, let's take what they can give us. Basically like K-State against Texas Tech last year in Lubbock, where they could have continued to try and play out a normal game and throw the ball here or there, but they said, Tech's not going to stop Avery's legs. Like, let's just do this, and it led to five touchdowns. Same thing with West Virginia. It led to almost a 300-yard night passing. So the offense was fine, uh, even in – DJ Ginn's worst statistical game of the season in terms of yardage uh, and his hit average, he still found a way to be productive for him, still had some nice runs, and then had the big catch. So uh, I don't think there's anything to, to really focus too much on for the offense. Uh, they did what they needed to do. They look good. Everything's starting to look cleaner and crisper, and uh, you definitely need that as you've got five games left now to try and decide if you're going to make it to Arlington or not. Uh, I will also add in you saw a little bit more creativeness out of the K State offense too, and, and I noticed that uh, just rewatching uh, just a few of the highlights uh, that I posted, and then just some clips that ever everybody else has posted uh, online so far, uh, because you saw the DJ Giddens big catch, and you you brought this up and at a good time because I was thinking about that play, and. K State faked the wheel route that DJ Giddens has been running successfully for the last two years. And he faked a wheel and cut it back inside on an angle route. And that just opened up a whole nother dimension and something that teams are going to have to look out for now because now you can't just sell out for the wheel route because West Virginia did that and it ended up being a 51 yard catch for DJ. So it, you add in that, you add in just all of the receivers. And I was talking to some of my friends earlier about how. K-State's -State, number one receiver is Jace Brown. But as a collective, they're playing so steadily 
that you probably don't need a number one because you had nine guys catch a ball against West Virginia. You had seven guys against Colorado that if you can just get steady performances from everybody, you probably don't need a true number one that you're like, okay, we need this guy to go seven catches for like 120 yards and a touchdown to really feel good about the passing game. If you can get steady, like three, four guys that can get multiple catches for around that 30 to 50 yards, I think you're fine. Yeah, and, and that just, I mean, that helps the offense in some ways. Like, yeah, obviously these teams that have legit number ones that uh, no matter what happens, you, you want to force them the ball and everything. And it, that's a different story. But these other teams that, like, we have to only rely on this guy, it it can hamper your offense in some ways. It makes you a lot easier to defend. But as we've seen, K-State's making their key plays through the air with seemingly a different guy every game, every play. Uh, and, and so then it's helpful to not have to kind of focus in on one guy. I, I This is kind of, I, I don't know if numbers even back it up, but it felt like in the moment, like as, uh, again, a post a post Super Bowl winning Cowboys fan uh, since I was born in 98, uh, when I thought it helped Dak Prescott and the Cowboys offense when Des Bryant was done, when he left the team, because then you didn't have a guy that was like, I need the ball. I need the ball. I need the ball. It felt like it opened up all the options to where Dak Prescott could just go out and be a quarterback and make the throws that he needed to make in the moment. And that's the opportunity that Avery Johnson has and is converting on right now in the K-State offense, where he can just go out there and be a quarterback and he doesn't care who he's throwing the ball to. I mean, it's great that he has his relationship with Jace Brown, as we saw in the Colorado game. Uh, and he can go to him in those moments, and he knows that he can trust him with certain types of balls that maybe he can't with other guys. But there doesn't seem to be any hesitation right now for Avery Johnson with anybody, and teams can't heavily focus on one guy or another because everybody's making plays for K State right now. I mean, that if you're like if you're Kansas, you would think, oh, Jace Brown, Jace Brown. But then Jane Jackson had a 60 yard touchdown in the previous game. He had 84 yards on two catches, like. He is being used. He is a big play type of guy. And I people will probably laugh, but I just I have no doubt that if the opportunity is there, Keegan Johnson or Dante Cephas or whoever else could be there. I mean, Sterling Lockett, if if Avery doesn't sail that ball at Tulane, he's got a big touchdown catch this year. So the K-State offense is in a spot right now that everybody is an option. Everybody's a weapon. They're gelling really well, uh, and I, I, it's it's a credit, obviously, to Avery Johnson as a young quarterback, but also Connor Riley and Matt Wells in this offense where there were a lot of questions about it and kind of the flow. It feels like over the last handful of games, we haven't really had any of those conversations. Um, statistically, they've been good for most of the season. Now we're starting to get to the point where it feels complete, uh, where it's the eye test is being passed as well right now with the K-State offense in, in many ways uh, more than once. So that's good news. Now, K-State defense, I'll be interested to get your thoughts on this because I thought early in the game, the secondary still struggled, despite the fact that, you know, Jack Fabris had an interception, Marquis Siegel had the pick six. Uh, what did you make of how the defense played really just in the first half? Because uh, they were, I mean, that was, it was a sick dog offense in the second half uh, with their three best offensive players out in green at quarterback, white at running back, and Milam at tackle. Uh, but in the first, what did you make of it? Because honestly, it, K-State just kind of got lucky, I think, uh, that West Virginia didn't score a touchdown right there at the end. I mean, they they got enough pressure to, to bring Green down and knock him out of the game and have his throw be kind of uh, – into the dirt, but you let him go all the way down there. And that very easily could have been a 17, 17 game uh, at the half. So I, I don't know that the K-State defense, especially the secondary, you, you feel a hundred percent about after this week still. Yeah. You still probably don't feel great uh, because even you brought up the, the drive before the end of the half, but there was uh, one play early on where Garrett Green just straight up missed a guy that probably could have gone for at worst a big play at or at at worst for West Virginia a big play at best a touchdown uh, that he just straight up missed and and sailed the throw and they had one that another guy was open and dropped so 
mixed bag for the secondary. I thought that they took a step in the right direction, but I, I think the defense as a whole after the pick six by Marquis Siegel kind of struggled. Uh, I don't know if it was because they were on the field almost the entire second quarter or kind of what that was in the first half. Uh, but they, they had a chance to, instead of putting the game away with the turnover on downs at the end of the half and then touchdown uh, to start the second half by K-State's offense, they could have put the game away when it was 17 to three and West Virginia had a third and 10 or a third and 11, and they let Garrett Green scramble and get a first down. And then eventually they score a touchdown to go up 17 to, or to cut it to 17 to 10. And then K-State's offense doesn't get a, doesn't get a scoring drive right after that. And then you get the last drive of the half where West Virginia has fourth and goal and doesn't convert. So you, you kind of think that the defense left a little bit out there, but I, I still think that it was a step in the right direction. Marischal isn't very good and didn't practice up until Thursday, I believe is what Neil Brown said after the game. So he was even pretty banged up. So the West Virginia offense was just completely lost in the second half. But you still, I think, took a step because you you were forcing incompletions at a higher rate than you had in the previous two weeks. And, and it was more like forced incompletions because some of that against uh, Oklahoma State and Alan Bowman was just him having some wild throws that like weren't even close to receivers. Uh, but Saturday you saw a defensive backs get their hands on the ball. One ended up being the tipped interception by Jack Fabris. Marquis Siegel had a nice play in the second half. I know that we were talking about how bad the West Virginia offense was in the second half, but that was an impressive play by Siegel to knock that away. So I think it was a step. Uh, the, the pass rush was pretty solid throughout the game. Brendan Mott, again, didn't really have like a huge statistical game, but what he is doing to oppose an op opposing offenses, I think needs to be celebrated a little bit more because West Virginia was throwing two guys at him for a lot of the game. They're holding him a lot of the game. And, and because of that, he freed up a lot of guys. Toby Osinsami had a tackle for a loss uh, because they were sending so much at Brendan Mott. Chidi Obiizer had his first career half a sack. And, and you even got to see at the end of the game, that Jordan Allen can also rush the passer too. So you're seeing all those guys come along. And I think just more and more credit needs to go to Brendan Mott because he's the old guy in the room that really kind of knows what's going on and can really teach these guys something. And because of his play, he's opening up more for other guys. Yeah. I, I don't think there should be any problems with how the, the defensive front played. I, maybe you could have said, get to the quarterback a little bit more, but, it's tough to do. I thought the the pressure was good enough to force some throws that the K State secondary should have defended a little bit better. Uh, and then you think up the middle, like it felt like West Virginia was getting a pretty good surge for like a yard or two, uh, but they weren't getting much more than that. So I guess credit to the to the tackles and then the linebackers for coming in and helping there as well. The the tackling wasn't great in the first half, especially in the quarterback run game, and that's yeah. probably something to be kind of looking for more than the, cause I think that the, the tackling in the first half was probably worse than the, the coverage. Mm -hmm. So you kind of, you need better tackling, especially this week because Jalen Daniels has been running more and more recently. Uh, but yeah. again, another whole well, um, 12, 12 tackle game for Austin Romaine. The the next two quarterbacks that you're going to face are are can be pretty run heavy uh, in Jalen Daniels. And then um, I it, it, I don't know what Houston's quarterback situation will be by the time that K State gets there uh, because uh, Zeon Chris played a little bit, but it was mostly Donovan Smith uh, against KU. So I don't know if they use Chris, then there's going to be some run game there, but even Donovan Smith uh, runs it a little bit. So you're going to have some opportunities the next couple of games where you need to kind of lock in uh, with the quarterback run game. But I, positives would be that Siegel has, I think Siegel's had a pretty good year anyways. Um, but now, he has that big play, and maybe that jump starts more of them. Uh, and we can officially – he will forever be stone hands to me, uh, but we can we can officially change that to soft hands, Siegel, now. So I'll still call him stone hands because I think I've earned that right. Again, I said it to his face, and he didn't punch me. 
but everybody else just know that it's soft hand single from here on out. So uh, anything else from the game with West Virginia that you think is notable moving forward for K-State? Uh, I think that they're still leaving a little bit to be desired on special teams as well. I, there have been some big moments for special teams, but consistently it's been not so great. Fumbled another kickoff, but Ace and Usum just happened to be there and recover it, which was a big play because, I mean, that that's something that could have really gone wrong for K-State. Uh, had a penalty that really wasn't necessary. And now you're probably without one of your main special teams guys the rest of the way with Bo Palmer. So special teams probably needs to step up a little bit more. Didn't punt the ball particularly well uh, Saturday night either. Uh, but I, I will say, Chris Sennett, though, just rock solid. Yeah, that's that's a fact. Uh, all right, let's move on. Let's talk a little Big 12 before we get into previewing KU as they come to town this week. Here are your Week 8 scores in the Big 12 Conference. Uh, what results stood out the most to you from Week 8? Uh, probably two results stand out the most. Uh, one was you could not have been more right about the butt bowl. Uh, but I don't think that you had Baylor winning that game by 24 points. Uh, and then the other one, I guess it's kind of a, a tie, and they're at the exact same scores. I think that we're seeing some of the flaws in Iowa State and BYU and how they played on Saturday. They are not good enough that they can just go out there and roll the ball out and beat any team. And, and I think that we kind of knew that beforehand, but we're really seeing it now. And especially BYU wise, because I was able to watch a lot more of that game. Uh, DY, by the way, did not even see kickoff of that game. Uh, that doesn't surprise me. That, <laughs> he's uh, you never know with his sleep schedule on the road. He is either out within like 30 minutes or he's just going to be up the entire time and catch the entire game. Whereas I'm pretty consistently not going to make it to the end of the fourth quarter of those late games. Uh, I did not see the end of BYU Oklahoma State Live. I did, and this is a nasty move by me. I stayed up and watched all of TCU Utah Ugh. on Saturday night. Yeah, that was a dumb move. I I, I saw I, I, I saw the end of both games. Uh, but for BYU wise, uh, what makes that game I think more frustrating, uh, K State wise, is you really saw how much BYU struggles against quarterback run because Garrett Rangel was running all over them in the first half. And, and if he doesn't get hurt, I think Oklahoma state might win that game by two scores. Uh, but he goes down and Alan Bowman was just kind of a mess. Like he has been all year. Uh, Iowa state. I didn't really get to see a ton of that game. Uh, but I think that that's more of a, Iowa state is, is a good team but they are not so good that they can really dominate every game yeah. like they have been all year. They are a team that doesn't have like any glaring hole. Like no, I think K state is the best team in the big 12, but right now they have a glaring hole, which is their secondary is struggling in a big way. Iowa state doesn't have that, but they're not so good in any area that they can you know what just go out there and avoid disaster at any point and they're probably their biggest weakness if there was one the offense does get a little inconsistent at times and can go through big stretches where they are not finding the end zone and scoring and that's i mean they got they were down 28 to 14 um the the unfortunate part about that game if you're looking from the k-state side of it is Really, in both of them. I mean, BYU scored with just over a minute left to win it. Iowa State scored like 30 seconds left. And uh, Iowa State, they, they got a questionable pass interference call to move them down to the goal line. Um, yeah, Iowa, but, State, Iowa State got a little help from the officiating. And then BYU got the benefit of what looked like Oklahoma State had quit on that last drive, which made no sense because they had just taken the lead. But their secondary looked like they wanted no part of being out there. Uh, another result that I find probably just more funny than anything else is, my God, Arizona. Like, yeah. ha ha have a little respect for yourself. 
That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it only score seven points when you're supposed to be good quarterback, good receiver, and you only score seven points against that defense. Uh, that's pretty disgusting. Although think about it. Like, they didn't score against K State, and K State's biggest weakness is their secondary. So I, I don't know. That's a, a mess. And and then Utah, Andy Ludwig like gets fired, quits, whatever. What I don't think that he is the problem at Utah. I know that he's probably not the solution, but the the problem is that Isaac Wilson is terrible, yeah, and Cam so. Rising is never healthy. Yeah. So I, I, I this what, is. What, without knowing too much about the situation. And I mean, if you, I think if you go and look, I doubt that the, I mean, it's certainly not to K state levels, but it almost feels like this is Utah is going through their end of the bill Snyder thing right now, where yeah. like, they've not replenished the talent that you need to continue to be at the level you want to be right now. So I think it's going to be fascinating to see if this ends up being Whittingham's last year. I mean, they already have named the DC Morgan Scaly or Scally, however you say it, uh, as the head coach in waiting. And Whittingham said at Big 12 Media Days that uh, he didn't think he'd be the head coach by it was either 26 or 27 when they played in that building to kick off the season. Um, I, I mean, I think this could be the last year for for Kyle Whittingham. But do you really want to hand it off to a Whittingham guy if like? Yeah things have dipped this bad the bottom could really fall out like they they play just the grossest big 12 game of the season this yeah. saturday and, and i'm not sure if they beat houston on the road because i i think that the the difference is that i think that houston will probably play hard and, I, and i'm not yeah. sure if utah is going to play hard yeah and utah it's it's a tough schedule after this weekend byu at home at Colorado, home against Iowa State, and then at UCF to finish out the season. Now, UCF is one that we'll see how much fight they have left in them uh, because Gus Malzahn, he might be the wounded duck of this league as well and everything else going on. Uh, and as you mentioned, the butt bowl. Uh, yeah, I thought Baylor could win the game. Uh, I did not think that they would score 59 points, and I didn't think that they would win by three scores. So uh, shout out to Dave Aranda and the boys uh, for not getting out of fraud warning, but bringing a fellow Big 12 coach right back into the warning. So uh, we'll get to that uh, in a little bit. But let's shift our focus now. Talk Sunflower Showdown this week. K-State, KU, the Jayhawks, they get some life because they beat Houston 42-14 to and just dominated them. It wasn't like it was a fluky, uh, you know, type of deal where, uh, you know, turnover luck, whatever. KU, I mean, they forced turnovers. Kobe Bryant had three picks of Donovan Smith, um, but it wasn't. In, you know, not like their game in Ames last year, where you think about that game and like they were getting, no, they, they just dominated and throttled Houston. Um, what's your expectation for this game as K-State goes for their 16th straight win over the Jayhawks? Yeah, I think that it's going to be a good game. I, I, I do think that KU is better than the two and five record shows. And the fact that they were able to just throttle Houston, I think kind of proves that because if they are, what their record says at two and five, you'd think that, that game would have probably been more of a dog fight, but the fact that they could just go and beat the crap out of Houston and really be locked in, it really kind of shows that they, they know that they are better than they are. And they've probably found something during the bye week The the offense and for as bad as Jalen Daniels looked in their first four games, uh, Daniels has really started to figure things out. He's not turning the ball over. He's being more efficient passing. So I, I think that this will be a probably closer game than even the line of minus 10 shows uh, because it, this is just such a big game for both teams. Uh, I will say that I was a little surprised that Devin Neal wasn't able to run as well as he had uh, throughout the season against Houston but still bust the 54 yard run to really boost his average. You're seeing KU run more, more of what Andy Kotelnicki ran uh, last year and, and the years prior with shifts, trades and motions in the last few games. Luke Grimm has been just a 
monster on these reverse plays that KU has <laughs> ran. So KC needs to watch out for that. And then, and then defensively, KU's defense it is solid. The, kind of like I, I'd compare their defense more towards like Oklahoma or, or uh, not Oklahoma State, West Virginia, where West Virginia's defense is pretty solid, but allows the big plays. And, and KU's defense has been bit by that. I think that they're near the bottom in the Big 12 and pass explosiveness and run explosiveness allowed. Uh, but I, I anticipate them playing pretty well and pretty inspired. And and I mean, they should be. It's it's a sunflower showdown. It's it's a big game. There's been a lot of jawing on both sides going way back to last basketball season, which is kind of wild. Uh, and then just player wise, and Chris Kleiman said this again today, that there's just so much experience on both teams that you go back and you rewatch the 2022 game because Chris Kleiman said that he did that uh, yesterday. Uh, my guess is probably to look more at Jalen Daniels mm-hmm. and what they did when he was out there. Uh, but you see a lot of faces on both teams that played in the 2022 game even. So it, it's a game that will probably be a dogfight. Yeah, I I think that this, this is a totally different KU team. You would have wanted to get them before the bye when they were wounded. And I think either way, you were going to probably get KU's best shot in this game. Like this felt like no matter the circumstance, if they had won or lost to Houston, or won a close game, won in a blowout like they did, whatever. This was going to be the last gasp at a big, big shot for KU this year. Like, those guys want to beat K-State. Uh, they know that they're better than what the record says, and this is their real last opportunity, basically, to go out and show it with any real source of information. Unless, I mean, if they lose to K-State, they have six losses. So then you're looking around and you're trying to say, okay, like, can they win out to get to a bowl game? It's tough. Their next three games are against, right now, the four. Their, their next four games are against the four best teams in the Big 12 right now. K-State, Iowa State, BYU, and Colorado. Uh, it's not an easy finish to the season for KU. So they need this game big picture for the season. But I think these these players, each one individually, they want it big picture for their legacy because – that's really the only way that the guys on this team right now can have a leg, a, a real big time legacy moving forward is if they end the streak for KU. I, I think they're going to give K-State a really tough game. And again, we talked about the secondary troubles. KU has great receiver play uh, and, and Jalen Daniels has been a better quarterback this year than people would like to say. Like he had some errors at times and he's had his bad moments, but He's playing a little bit better uh, than he had, you know, at different points. And he's also the last two games have been his best of the season by far. Uh, He's thrown for over 500 yards, five touchdowns, no picks in those games. He's getting things turned around. He's playing his best football at the right time. And like you talked about, uh, he ran the ball seven times for 58 yards and a touchdown against Houston as well. So he's bringing the run game back into play. Yeah, he, he has definitely played his best football of late. He has 10 touchdowns passing on the year, five in the last two games, no interceptions. I, I don't think that he's fumbled in the last uh, two games as well. And, and again, just the fact that he's been able to use his legs more it is going to be a challenge. I mean, he's had two games with double-digit carries, and he's had two games with seven carries. So I, I anticipate him probably running a little bit more than – we have anticipated him or anticipated him running to begin the year and, and really throughout his career. Cause he, he's capable of running, but he's running more now and running a lot more speed option now, uh, which has been one of KU's key plays all year has been, if they need a first down on short yardage, it feels like they've ran a lot of speed option. They've ran, ran a lot of reverses. So you're going to get KU's best shot. And, and, and I'm really looking forward to the game and, Looking forward to the atmosphere, too, because the one thing that we haven't really talked about is that this is going to be K-State's first home game in 28 days, and it happens to be against KU on homecoming after winning two or winning three games in a row now. So I think that the crowd is going to be pretty juiced up as well. I'm fascinated to hear you say that you're uh, excited and 
and ready for this game because I am not. Um, I look, I, I said it last year and I, I've made this clear. I like to think of myself as being one of the more impartial observers of K State covering the team of those of us that obviously went to K State uh, because a majority of us did. But I'm never going to be shy about the fact that I went to K State, my parents went to K State. I've got a brother that goes to K-State. I met my wife at K-State. Like so much of my life has been about K-State and I love Manhattan and I love that place. And so it, I still will always and forever want K-State to do well. I am always pulling for K-State. I'm always rooting for K-State, um, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be homer when i'm talking about them and i'm not going to be homer when i'm they're covering i'm not going to have you know kenny and ryan yelling down during the game no cheering or whatever uh, at me um like you know some people in different press boxes have or whatever um but what i always i brought this up last year is nobody wants to see me deal with a k-state loss to ku i mean that's that would be coming from the perspective of a let's see well, it would have been fifth grade was the last time K-State lost to KU in football, I think. Yeah, yeah, I was in the fifth grade the last time K-State lost to KU in football. It's the only, that's the only way that my body and brain knows how to emotionally handle K-State losing to KU in football is as a fifth grader. You know, I'm, I'm a 26-year-old man now. Um, I, nobody wants that. I don't want that. And I think as this streak continues to grow and grow and grow, as it's on year 15, trying to get to 16, I think there becomes more stress involved in each game. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, there's a lot of weight in K-State season as well. I mean, two of the last three matchups that K-State has had with KU, they need those wins to keep themselves on a driver's seat path to Arlington. Because K-State right now, even though they're not one of the top two teams, as long as they win out, they are playing for a Big 12 title. So that's one of those things where there's so much that goes into it. I, this, this game is just, it's, it's the one game that I go into it even still as detached as I think I've been able to get myself since I started covering the team from a media perspective. It's still the one that internally has me in those moments that are like, this is not fun. This is not fun. Like, just get this game over with and win it, please. Like, come on, let's go. Uh, because I'm just like the rest of you watching this. 98% of the people that I've encountered in my life that went to the University of Kansas, I do not like. Like, I'll be upfront about that. I Sure, I know some, I know some people that I really adore that went to KU. Uh, shout out to my cousin, Logan. Uh, shout out to, to Mike Kinney. Uh, but outside of that, a lot of you that I've encountered pompous jerks, not people I want to interact with on a daily basis. Like I don't, I don't like KU not because of football or basketball or whatever, uh, because of the people that they breed in Lawrence. So this is, this is always going to be very important to people, uh, in the state. And this is one of those deals where as it goes longer and longer, because teams just don't beat teams like this consistently in college football, because think, look around the rest of the big 12, like Texas was not able to go on this run against KU, Oklahoma, I guess came close probably to going on a run like this against KU. I'd have to go see before last year what they did. TCU was not able to avoid losing to them. Baylor, Texas Tech, Oklahoma State. You look around at all these other teams in the Big 12. They were not, West Virginia, they were not able to avoid one of these disappointing losses to KU. Uh, so what K-State well, has I'll, done is incredibly impressive and special here. I'll take it a, a step further and you look across the, the country rivalry-wise. This doesn't happen super often. And it's something that K-State, I think, I don't want to say the K-State fans are like spoiled by it, but it's not super often where you are one team in a rivalry. And in our lifetime, K-State has had a double digit win streak twice. Like that just doesn't happen. And being able to experience it is just kind of a wild thing. And like, 
eventually the streak is going to end. But the longer that the streak goes on, there is 1,000% so much more stress on the K-State side of it because you have to be... Like, there is... I would imagine... And, like, I, I don't know 1,000% without a shadow of a doubt what the K-State locker room is like. But if I was a player on K-State's team and I was one of the starters or if I was a senior... I'd be like, I'm not going to be the the class that loses to KU and yeah. breaks the streak. So, so I just think from I'm, that perspective, there's so much more stress. I'm looking here to see uh, at like uninterrupted series and these crazy win streaks and uh, most consecutive wins over an opponent. Um, there aren't a ton that totally match up to like where we're at because eras are very different. Like, I don't know that you're going to see many that continue into this decade or even the last decade that you think about. Um, no, cause uh, Duke had had their first win over Florida state in 22 tries uh, on Friday yeah. night, but that, that is not a consecutive, like they play every year kind yeah. of deal. So the, uh, the way to look at this, Florida beat Kentucky 31 straight times from 1987 to 2017. That would probably be the best modern equivalent. Like uh, Nebraska beat KU 36 straight times from 1969 to 2004. That was uninterrupted. Uh, Notre Dame beat Navy 43 straight times, but totally different dynamic there. Uh, as most people know, uh, Oklahoma kind of owned K-State in a lot of ways. Uh, there are multiple um, Oklahoma K State streaks on this list, uh, 22 straight 1971 to 1992, uh, and then also uh, back before then. But if you look around at when some of these ended, like it hasn't lasted all that long. I, I see your the Duke one in there, um, but like you mentioned, no, it it was not uninterrupted. Same for uh, like Florida and Vanderbilt. Uh, that one had periods where they did not play um so there there are a lot of these where you look at them and say in the modern era we haven't seen a lot of this um and i think it's going to be fascinating uh, to see it how it continues for k-state but i think you're right this if you're a player on the team like you don't want your legacy to be we were the ones that let this thing die and i also have a tough time again i, I wrote about this in the off season. I have a tough time seeing the legacy and the, the story of Avery Johnson being that in his first crack in the Sunflower Showdown, he lost the streak at home. It seems unlikely to me. I don't know if it's going to be close or a blowout. I think it's going to be a tough game for K-State. I just don't know that they lose this one. But we'll talk a lot more about K-State KU through the rest of the week. I don't want anybody to get nervous or uh, not have fun right now. It's only Monday. We have to talk basketball at Media Day on Wednesday. So once we get past Wednesday, we'll focus on the scary nature of this game and uh, the nail-biting time of trying to win a 16th straight over Kansas for K-State. You know, I just, lo I just looked up one that I was like, okay, I know that these teams have played a lot. And did you realize that the Georgia Georgia Tech series they've played every year since 1930? Oh wait, no, even further than that they've played every year since 1925. Uh, the longest streak in that series is only eight. That's pretty crazy. And and, and, and even crazier, uh, Georgia Tech is the one that has the longest win streak in that series. The, the current streak is Georgia by has won the last six and will probably make it seven this year, but that series has never gone over 10. That's wild to me. Wild. Uh, Mark Richt, what the heck, dude? How are you losing games to Georgia Tech? Uh, but you know, also probably a reason why uh, Mark Richt wasn't there. I, I would venture to guess that uh, the current six game streak that Georgia's on extends quite a while, but that would just be me. Uh, but anyways, enough with the negative. It's time for everybody's favorite part of the Sunday show. Let's do fraud watch to close out the week. And again, a reminder, this is what it looked like last week. This was a, this was a lot of movement last week. So here, here is the trajectory. 
This is like watching the, the hurricane track. This is week six, fraud watch, just for everybody to remember. And then we've got week seven. So you see some movement there. And then week eight, hold on to your butts, everybody, because oh we got frauds galore in the Big 12. We also have some big movers. I want, I want that to be known. So let's start this puppy off with a look at Fraud Watch Week 8. Congratulations, Lance Leipold. You won a game. I don't know if you took accountability. I really don't care. Uh, you don't deserve to be a fraud. That's why we had the tag on. It's until you take accountability. It doesn't matter. You won by a million. We know you're better than that. No man's land for you. Obviously, if you win this weekend, I will hate you forever. But you probably have to be given back your stud status. So um, just hold off. And as long as you win, like, two of the next three games after K-State, certified stud the rest of your life. I will give you that uh, until I feel like dunking on you again. Congratulations to Deion Sanders. Who would have thought that he was going to be able to make this big of a move to go from firmly as a fraud warning to he is the lone member of the fraud watch category now. Uh, I am proud of Deion Sanders. And the way they bounce back, congratulations, good for them. So, Deion Sanders, hats off to you. Mike Gundy doesn't really move with his two spots that he takes up. Kyle Whittingham, son, hang it up, loser. Uh, you're not going to get a real quarterback, it would appear. Just call it quits after this year. Don't tarnish your legacy. Your team sucks. Uh, it's unfortunate for the rest of the league that doesn't get to play you that that game is not happening this year. Um, but yeah, congratulations, Neil Brown. See ya. Uh, how poor is West Virginia? I mean, I know that I don't, I don't want to say that I was, I was going to bring in state statistics and probably like, you know, average median income or education and all that stuff. I'm not going to go there, but how poor do you have to be at West Virginia to not fire Neil Brown after Saturday's game? Uh, either that or Ren Baker is a loser. So Ren Baker, if Neil Brown is not fired before the season's over, you will be on fraud watches as, as well. That's the West Virginia AD who, by the way, was the AD at North Texas with Seth Luttrell. So he might be the biggest fraud that we talk about today. Uh, I'm sure this my voice makes this segment a lot better for everybody. Joey McGuire, uh, welcome back, Buckaroo. Uh, <laughs> I've had enough of you trying to act like you were back. We all had to pretend like, oh, Texas Tech, they might be this, they might be that. They're not. Joey McGuire, welcome back. Fraud warning. Sonny Dykes, good for you. You beat a terrible Utah team. Uh, try scoring more than 13 points. Beat somebody that I actually give a rip about. So uh, you're still a fraud. Dave Aranda, I love you. I don't know that a win at Texas Tech is going to be enough for you, but but I will give you this. Sawyer Robertson, is he the guy? I mean, Baylor, I think, is going to win a game this weekend. They get Oklahoma State at home. Then it's TCU. Then at West Virginia, at Houston, KU at home. I think Dave Aranda is going to be out of the fraud warning list by the end of the year, I think the Bears are going bowling this season, Drew. <laughs> Who would have thought that? That's BGB, a... Bears go bowling. Let's do this thing. Uh, finishing things off then just to get through the rest of the list. As a reminder, Kalani Sataki still a stud by a field goal margin. Brent Brennan, fraud warning. Boy, get out of that now while you can, Arizona. That thing's collapsing. See you later. Uh, Gus Malzahn. You almost beat Iowa State. You're very close to also going to fraud warning. A lot of frauds in the Big 12. The big fraud is what this league is going to start being called. Uh, it's a shame that all those studs are having to prop up the rest of the league right now. So that is Fraud Watch Week 8, and that is your KSO Sunday show for Week 8 as well. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Both. Thanks for watching and listening and suffering through my voice on this. We hope to have the entire crew back next week with Fan not dying. He'll be back at some point in the near future. We'll have next Sunday show recapping Sunflower Showdown. Hopefully it's not a sad day. 
We need to do our basketball Big 12 stock draft, which could get very interesting. So we'll have that and uh, plenty of other things going on next week as well. And then coverage throughout the entire week as we get more K-State KU build up for football. And then as mentioned, Wednesday is media day in Kansas City for Big 12 basketball. So Drew and I will be there. We'll have all the stuff that you need from Jerome Tang, Coleman Hawkins, David Gasson, uh, and Max Jones Max is Jones. the third. Max Jones is the third one going to be there. So there you go. That's what we got going for you. Thank you for watching and listening. If you want more on the Cats, head over to On3, findkstateonline.com, and uh, we'll talk to you again tomorrow.